This is Business of Architecture, episode 21. This is the Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, this is Enoch, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects, where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. Welcome, Agile Architects, back to the Business of Architecture. Today we have the honor of having William J. Martin with us. He's the owner of WJM Architect out of New Jersey, about 15 minutes outside of Manhattan. So welcome to the show, Bill. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's, it's good to have you. So, Bill, you are an architect. You are a sole practitioner. And I've told our audience a little bit about you. But go ahead and share a little bit about yourself personally and then tell us a little bit about your business. Okay. Um, depends on how far back you want me to go. Uh, first, the earth cooled. Then I was born. <laughs> but at the, uh, at the age of six, uh, my father decided to make some alterations to our house and had some difficulty. And I was fascinated by what was going on inside the walls. So at the age of six, I became very interested in this. And of course, you know, like most children, playing with blocks and Legos and, and these kinds of things and Tinker Toys and all kinds of stuff like that, I uh, developed a very creative interest in architecture. And as I was growing up and I became an older child, you know, tree houses and forts and things like that. And uh, as I got to be a teenager, I started to learn more about this profession. And I was very intrigued by it. I thought it was a great way to spend my life. So I decided that uh, this is what I would study. I also dabbled in photography a little bit as a teenager. Um, but that's how I ended up deciding on architecture as a profession. I applied to colleges. I got into most of the colleges. Uh, I got into my top three. That, uh, But I wasn't shooting for Ivy League. I was shooting for a well-rounded education. I uh, attended Carnegie Mellon University for three years. I spent the first two years in the architecture program, and I decided that I needed to have a broader horizon, and I decided that uh, I wanted to understand the business and economic side of the profession. So I spent the last year at Carnegie Mellon in managerial economics, uh, and then I left Carnegie Mellon for Pratt Institute in New York City, which is not far from where I am now, in Brooklyn, where I continued my architectural degree and also studied real estate development so that I could have a well-rounded understanding of the economics of design. I needed, I realized early on that I needed to know uh, the underlying economics behind the decision-making that goes into creating buildings. And this is not something I, that I found was part of their regular curriculum. So that's, that's my educational background. Um, after that, I interned with three architectural firms and very quickly uh, moved on, uh, passed my exam, very quickly moved on, hung out my shingle as soon as I could and uh, to get my uh, sole proprietorship started. And that's what brings me up to approximately where I'm at now, except it's now 20 years plus since I uh, first hung out that shingle. Excellent. So we have a lot to dive into. Bill, you said during school that you wanted to get a foundation in the underlying economics of, you talked about real estate development and yes. the managerial courses you took at, at Carnegie Mellon. Tell yes. us, what do you think are some of the basic foundations that architects need to understand in terms of the economics? Well, understanding the cost of materials and the cost of labor is important. Understanding what it takes to implement a design. Now, you don't want it to cramp your creativity, but you should have an understanding of what it is that you're asking a potential client to sign on to and what it would take actually for a contractor to implement. So, like I said, you don't want it to, to uh, limit your creativity, but you have to balance your creativity with the realities of structure, with the realities of materials, with the realities of labor, in a sense, to create that aesthetic, what I call an econo-functional aesthetic balance. When you have that, in my opinion, you have good design. Excellent. When we talk about your business background, 
what's the the biggest thing how's the biggest way that that helps you in your architectural practice being able to discuss with clients what their goals are in a way that shows that I am trying to help them and not just help them to achieve good design but also help them to achieve a uh, an efficient um, expenditure of their resources, whatever that may be, whatever dollars they have devoted to a project. I want them to understand that I'm with them in terms of trying to uh, solve, achieve their goals in, in every way. Okay, let's dig into that a little bit. Can you help me? Do you have any examples or maybe a, an example conversation, how that conversation would go? Um, okay, the, uh, you know, generally when a, when a client calls you, the, you know, they say, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want a new office building, or I want to add on to an office building, or I want to add on to my home, or I need a new home. Then, you know, very soon after that, the next question is, oh, but I have a budget. Now, so everyone has a budget. So the first thing I do is when I meet with them, I try to be a good listener. I try to find out what are all of their goals. Their goals are not all economic. You know, it's not all about building cheaply. It's about achieving uh, the space that they need, but achieving it in, in a reasonable manner, what, what they define as a reasonable manner. So that means you have to be sure that you're a good listener and you uh, uh, listen to what their uh, financial goals are, their design goals are, and their functional goals are. And you need to find that balance. So I uh, discuss these things with them in uh, economic terms, in design terms, and I develop a relationship with them so that they understand that I'm going to help them to achieve their goals. Okay, and so what are some example uh, questions that you might ask those clients on your first visit with them? Well, first of all, I never ask them what their budget is. I ask them, what is it that you are trying to do? And they'll say, let's, let's use um, residential design as an example. There, uh, in this area, there's a lot of homes that are already here. We're, we're in a well-developed area. I wouldn't characterize it as, as uh, urban, but it's, it's very suburban. Lots of homes, big lawns, things like that. People are looking to, instead of move, they, they like where they are. They like their towns. They like the school systems. They want to uh, improve their home, and they need more space. So I have to find out from them, what does that mean to them? Is it bedrooms they need? Is it a bigger kitchen they need? Is it a family room they need? What is it that they need? Um, and I encourage them to, because it doesn't cost anything to talk about it, I encourage them to you know, tell me what you really need. And then what I do is I start to discuss with them potentially what these things might cost. I don't do it at that initial meeting. I take some time, digest what they want. And then and I look at their property survey. I look at any existing drawings they may have of their house, if they have any. Um, or if it's a new home, and I do some basic budgeting for them initially based on careful listening of what they told me they were trying to achieve. And then I begin a discussion about, okay, this is what you told me you wanted to do. This is how much I think it costs, plus or minus. So this is what you're getting yourself into. It gives them a chance to take a step back early on in the design process and understand what the value is that they're going to get in relationship to what they're going to spend, in relationship to the ultimate aesthetics and the design of, of their home. It helps them to understand their goals. That's the first thing that I do. That's before, okay. I, even, that's before I even quote a fee. And then when they get that initial budget estimate back from you, is there a typical response? Are some of them surprised or do they take it in stride? What's the, is there a kind of a typical response you get at that point? Well, this, this is exactly why I start this way, because everyone has a different idea of what things cost. Um, some people are surprised, uh, you know, that it's as reasonable it is, but those are in the minority. Most people are shocked at how expensive construction actually is. Um, and because of my background, I can get them pretty close. Provided they tell me everything that they are trying to accomplish, I can get within uh, 5 or 10% of ultimately what it will cost to do what they want to do. And that's based on you know, normal middle range stuff, the, the normal things that people expect to find in this area uh, it, you know, in terms of 
2013 dollars, so to speak. So I, I speak in very economic terms when I talk to them about costs because they're very concerned about it. They have to make sure that they can secure the, the financing and the resources to uh, implement the design. So it's important that these discussions happen early on. Okay. Now, have you, what would you, what would be, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. What would you say if the client at that point says, okay, um, Mr. Martin, thank you for, thank you for taking your time to do the budget. You know, these numbers seem a little bit high. We talked to our, our brother-in-law, he's a contractor and we're going to do owner build. Um, you know, he says we can build this for $80 a square foot and your numbers are higher than that. How do you, where do you, ha how do you handle that conversation? This happens all the time because very often uh, when others talk about construction costs, they leave a lot of things out. Uh, a lot of uh, builders and contractors, and, and there's nothing wrong with the way they do. There's an actually economic reason why they do it, but they leave out a lot of the finishes. They'll leave out the tile in the bath. They'll leave out the bathroom fixtures, the lighting fixtures. They leave all those things out. So what happens is their numbers will gel down to a lower number than what I'm talking about. But I make it clear to my clients that I'm talking about complete and finished construction. They're going to want bathroom fixtures. They're going to want lighting fixtures. They're going to want kitchen cabinetry. They're going to want the stone countertops. I mean, I'm not talking about bare bones bottom line stuff. I'm talking about normal middle range finish and fit up that most people would want in their market. And again, I talk it very, I, very often I will talk in economic terms as I describe design so that they will understand that I'm here to help them to achieve their goals. Is there any time when just because of what the client, the way the client is approaching them that you want to vet them a little bit that maybe say, maybe, maybe you're not the right client for me because you can sort of see down the line that there's going to be problems with their budget numbers. Does that happen very often? Uh, it, this happens all the time, and I am fortunate that I do not have to take on every client that comes my way. Um, and part of the reason why I do this initial evaluation of what they're trying to achieve is to help me to ascertain as to whether or not it is achievable based on what they're telling me their project constraints are. If I don't feel that their goals are achievable, based on uh, what they describe design-wise and what they describe as the resources available to execute the design, I will politely decline the project. But I make it clear to them because I, I want to help people. I became an architect to help people. People struggle with this all the time, and they're talking with other people who may have a vested interest in their decision-making. So. You know, as I decline a project, I will say to them, you really need to be very careful how you proceed because you could end up making an expensive error. So take a step back, you know, be calm about it, but make sure that you understand the context into which you are now about to try to achieve something that, in my opinion, may not be achievable. Bill, I'm trying something new today with the interview, and I want to ask you for a success quote. Did you come prepared with a success quote that you can share with us today? Um, I did. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of Mies van der Rohe. I enjoy not so much his architecture end product, but his search for essential factors in design. Um, so I, I prefer his quote, God is in the details, as being very descriptive. Um, as to what we do as architects on so many levels. Uh, in fact, I've turned it around and many people have turned it around and said, well, the devil is in the details. So then you've got to decide whether, you know, which force do you believe is the stronger spiritual force? But the, the fact is that the details matter in everything. They, they matter in your conversations with clients. They matter in your conversations with contractors and other construction professionals. They matter in the, the uh, construction documents. They matter in the design documents. Uh, the details matter and the success of the design, the God in the design is in those details. So very, that would be very, my quote. Very appropriate quote, Bill. Appreciate it. <laughs> so let, let's take us back to those early days when you started your firm because like you, we mentioned in the intro, you are a sole practitioner. And yes. tell us about the process of getting your initial license and then deciding that you wanted to go out on your own. All right. I, uh, I realized very early on, almost bef even before I was in college, that I needed to understand the economic basis behind what I wanted to do professionally. Uh, as soon as I was able, 
my very first summer after my freshman year, I went out and got a job in an architectural firm. And that first year, I was mainly, mainly running blueprints, and I did get to do some drawings. The, I was very fortunate that the uh, architects in that firm uh, felt very strongly about giving back to the future of the profession. And even though I had limited skills, uh, they brought me on, and I learned what really happens in an office, which is so much different than what happens in your first couple of years in architecture school. So I did that my first summer. I went back my second summer. And um, after I left Carnegie Mellon and went to Pratt, I pushed all of my course load into three days so that I could then work the other three days. Wow. So I did that for three and a half years until I graduated from Pratt. My degree is in architecture. I graduated with honors. It's a Bachelor of Architecture degree. And at Pratt, they didn't have, they didn't assign a, uh, an alternate degree or a minor. So I kind of pursued this on my own. But I tell people my concentration was business, economics, and real estate. And that's what my educational background is. So I came out of school with, a, with not just the college education, but also having interned over the four or five intervening summers and then working all year long in a firm while I was carrying a full, uh, full course load. Uh, it was not easy to do, but it was, in, in my view, it was absolutely critical. I came out of school understanding the context in, what I, in which I was then going to get a job, finish my internship, and then start a practice. Okay, I'm going to uh, pause you right there, Bill, and I'm just going to ask about, you mentioned that you got to see what really happens and you had some additional knowledge that maybe some other architects architecture students who just go to a more traditional route don't have. What are some of the things that you learned that other architects coming out of school might not know about? How the details actually get worked out. Um, it's important because you know you uh, back then we were all everything was on drawing boards. We're drawing everything by hand. It was a very traditional uh, way of practicing. I mean it was back in the uh, early 80s. Um, you know Drawings got done, they went out for bid, and as they were being built, we would very often have to develop additional details to address issues that came up during the construction. This was fascinating to me because it had to work within the context of what had already been designed, uh, and it had to achieve not just the economic goal of not costing more, uh, but also um, fulfill the function and uh, enhance the aesthetic. And I found that to be fascinating as a way that the, uh, uh, the architect interacts with the contractor and interacts with the owner while the, the building is getting built. That is something that, uh, you know, I understand things are changing in the colleges, that internships and, and externships, or whatever they want to call them, are becoming more popular. And I'm very glad to see that because I, I learned an enormous amount from working while I was going to school is very important. In fact, when I came when I came out of school, when I applied for jobs, it was uh, we were in the middle of a recession. I sent out ten resumes. I got eight calls, and I got four offers. So I was very fortunate to have that experience. It also gave me an edge uh, in terms of trying to get a job coming right out of out of college. So that that it, I can't stress that enough. So let's, let's, boil down, let's boil down one lesson for students that are in college that might be listening to this now from what you learned about your experience to help you get a job. How would you boil that down into one sentence? I would say into one sentence? Oh sure, my God. a couple sentences. <laughs> I could speak for hours and volumes on this. Um, study business. Take economics. Basic economics. Doesn't have to be complicated. Just basic economics about how things are optimized how uh, uh, things are efficiently distributed. These are valuable skills to help you in your thinking process while you are designing. Uh, and go out and get an internship any way you can. Try, get a job in an office, you know, in the summers, you know, you make copies, maybe you do some drawing, you have some computer skills, it's great, but get in there and, and be in the environment because you'll absorb things from the environment just being there. Okay, so you graduated from school, you went on to work for three different firms, and then you hung out your shingle. Tell us about the, the process of going from full-time employment to self-employment. Well, you, you, at first I had to build up some dollars to uh, be able to um, you know, bridge over. So you were saving. So you, did you go into yeah. that first job knowing that you were going to try to save enough money to build yourself a runway? Absolutely. 
you have to plan ahead. I knew that I wanted to have my shingle out as, as quickly as I could get it out there. Uh, going into business is a risk. And um, I, I needed to do it early in my career so, because it doesn't get any easier as you wait. Uh, so the, the sooner you begin to, to make you set yourself up with short-term goals in order to generate uh, maybe some savings in order to bridge over, and then you have longer-term goals. Where do I want to be in a year? Where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years? Um, these are the kinds of things that you have to decide early on. Now, some architects come out of school, they want to go to work in a large firm. They want to do, they want to be involved in high profile skyscrapers or things like that. And that's great. That's wonderful. But that wasn't for me. I wanted creative control and I wanted to start from the ground up. And I'm very satisfied with the work that I do. But I don't do skyscrapers. I don't do, uh, you know, the covers of uh, Architect Magazine which is fine, but you need to have goals. You need to set up goals and decide where you want to be. Do you remember some of your goals at that, at that early stage? You, you mentioned sort of a goal a year out, at five years out, 10 years out. Do you remember what yes. your goals were? It was about being able to bridge over, mostly about financial concerns. Again, here we go back to economics. You know, even architects are forced to think about economics from their own personal standpoint. Then it was uh, time management. If I was going to try to pick up clients on the side, um, I had to make sure that I had sufficient time to service them properly. If I didn't service them properly, I would not be doing very well trying to get my shingle out there. Uh, but I was, I was fortunate. I, um, I was able to find clients fairly easily, which many of my colleagues complained that they were not able to do that. Um, I mean, it's just from connections, family, friends, and things like that. But it gave me a start so that I could then um, take the risk and leave the firm I was with, hang out my own shingle, and begin my own uh, firm. When you started your firm and hung out your shingle, do you remember how long of a runway you had in terms of months before you would be forced to be homeless and starving? <laughs> uh, well, fortunately, my uh, fiance, now wife, was working full time, so there was some. I had a little bit. I wasn't going to end up out on the street necessarily, <laughs> provided I behaved myself. <laughs> uh, but I had uh, I had a timeline of about a year. I had to get it set up within a year, and I was very determined. Um, and that's the way it worked out. I was very fortunate. It's uh, you know it doesn't always work out. No, that's but very true, and we know we've seen that a lot. What are some of the keys that you think helped you to be able to get clients in those early days? Just the approach that I described at the beginning of this interview is how I approach everything. Clients noticed immediately, especially, com especially commercial clients who are very concerned many times about resources, that I was someone that they could talk to, that I wasn't talking about um, – high design, far-flung ideas that were going to ultimately be risky for them to try to implement because there were too many things that were undefined about how it would end up. I talk to them in real terms, in economic terms. They get their comfort level uh, to a point where they're comfortable with me, and then all of a sudden, it was like the floodgates opened up. Okay, and when I'm trying to go back in my head and figure out what that, once again, what that conversation would be like so that maybe other architects would like to do the same thing or or people who are looking to go out on their own can sort of recreate that conversation. If you had a commercial client come in there, what sort of things would you say to demonstrate that you are capable, that you're going to pay attention to the budget, and that, like you said, they don't have a lot of risk of you doing some strange thing that they haven't heard of before or taking them from left field? First, I want to point out that risk is not all about money. Risk can also be about hiring someone and you're unsure that they're going to be able to complete the task that you're giving them. So I would focus more on that. What I do is when I get a commercial client, I research them. I try to find out about them. I try to find out what, the, you know, I ask them what their goals are. Um, but I also try to find out some background information about them ahead of time so that I can understand better what their goals really are. If I have a commercial client that's built a lot of high design, then I focus more when, in my discussions with them about how we can achieve more high design. A client like that has the resources to implement a complex design, and they're not afraid of it. 
they want to understand that you have the skills to create the design that they're looking to implement. Now, a client that is a small operation, a small commercial operation, is going to be much more focused on economic resources like money, financing, construction costs, things like that. So when I, as I research my client, as they tell me about what their goals are, I focus my conversation onto those aspects. I can do both. As an architect, we're trained in aesthetics, functions, and, you know, with all the experience I have and my education, I'm also trained in the economic side. Uh, many architects develop that economic sense as they practice. So this is how I approach a new client, especially in the commercial side. Okay. So you mentioned in terms of going out on your own, just going to rephrase here, you said that you had saved up enough money to get you through a year of practice. Yes. And that you had a network of friends and family that was able to provide you with some early clients. Right. Did you do any active marketing during those those early years? Um, it was before. It was really before email started. Email didn't take off for a while, so the internet was uh, was not there yet. Uh, it was basically, you know, being out there, being in the community, being known. Um, I sat at the time I was appointed by the local government here, I was appointed to the zoning board to be a member of the zoning board, volunteering in the community. That's an unpaid, unpaid position, by the way. Uh, but you, uh, but that's how you get your name out there. You, uh, you know, people meet you in the community, you're volunteering, you're helping the community, you're helping people, and then they find out you're an architect and suddenly they, uh, they find out that they need one. Or, or maybe they don't know that they need one, but in a conversation with you, in the context of, of, of you know, helping the community, they find out that you're a good resource. You want to be a good resource for the general population, and that's how you get recommendations, and that's how you get referrals, and that's how you can pick up clients. Okay. So in addition to volunteering and getting yourself out there, did you do any other active marketing? I didn't initially because it's expensive. It, it was expensive at the time. You're talking about print media, essentially, at the time. So I, uh, I relied on the clients that I had, and I asked them point blank, please recommend me to your friends and family if they need something. I mean, even if they're not sure they need something, please give them my name. I will come and talk to them about it, and uh, you know, I can at least help them. If they want to decide against something, I can help them decide against it even. In fact, I have that conversation with clients even today. Uh, very often they'll ask me, you know, it's worth doing this. And I said, well, that's, you know, a question you have to ask yourself, but maybe you're not ready to do anything. Why don't you sit back, you know, for three or four months, do some more homework and call me then. Bill, I've heard that running a firm by yourself as a sole practitioner is like pushing boulders uphill. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about a failure that you've had and how you've overcome that failure and turned it into success. Okay, I mentioned earlier that you had to have long and short-term goals as you begin this process of, you know, trying to hang out a shingle and get your business started. The biggest mistake that I made early on, and it, it occupied me for about the first four years. Now, it wasn't that I wasn't making money, but the, the, here's the mistake. I wasn't clear with myself as to whether I wanted to be a big firm with lots of employees or whether I wanted to be a small firm and focus on design and have less employees or in the current situation have, have no employees. At that time, again, computers were coming into use, but they were not there yet. So you're still talking about drawing by hand. Uh, you're talking about manpower involved in drawing by hand. And, uh, and those were the the aspects of things that I was dealing with in the first few years of practice, but that was a mistake. I should have been more clear in my goals and I should have been more honest with myself about whether I wanted to be a big firm or whether I wanted to be a little firm. At first I thought, I want to be a big firm. I mean, I, I, again, I was very fortunate starting out. I came out of school in the middle of a recession, but there was money out there to do things. Not everybody needs a bank in order to build. And I was fortunate to come into uh, some, um, some clients with 
that were in that situation. They had spent decades positioning themselves that they didn't necessarily need to borrow lots of money. So they were in a good position in a recession. And that's when they did work. They did work in the recession when no one else was. So I connected with, um, with this uh, real estate limited partnership. They were very nice to me. They, I did a lot of work with them. I did shopping centers. I did distribution facilities. I did big projects. I mean, redesigning 750,000 square foot warehouses. Um, they had several shopping centers. I did facelifts on them. Uh, some nice design work, not, not crazy stuff, normal stuff. Um, I think we did a good job in relation to what they were willing to devote in terms of resources. Uh, but it was one client that was occupying nearly all of my time. And I did that for about three to four years. Now, I did have other projects going on with other clients, but I was hoping that that large client would then branch me off into other large clients. That didn't materialize. I learned a valuable lesson from that. Uh, they were very good to me. And, um, you know, as the economy, believe it or not, as the economy started to get better, they started to do less. So I had employees. I had uh, uh, at one point I had uh, three employees plus myself. And then, of course, you have to start to worry about things like overhead and payroll taxes and, you know, all the business aspects of, of running a firm, which I realized having gone through that. And I'm and in a way, it's good to make mistakes because you learn a lot. Having gone through that, I realized that I didn't go to architecture school and and. I'll say suffer through that, but it wasn't really suffering because it was a joy to, to learn and do the work. But I didn't go through all of that to run a business and sit in a chair in an office. I wanted to design it. I wanted to be on site. I wanted to talk to the client. I wanted to create the design. I wanted to create the details. I wanted to do all of the things that I was taught to do in college and in my internships. So I began to pull back, and as time went on, I just allowed employees to go until it was, I was just a sole proprietor, and, I am, and I've been doing that now. It's probably about 15 years now that I've been sole proprietor, uh, and I enjoy it immensely. And a lot of the reason that I've been able to do it has been because of the imp tremendous improvement in computer technology in terms of how computers help us to execute our, our designs. And what are you referring to specifically in terms of the computer helping you? Uh, well, I started with a program called Generic CAD, which was a very simple 2D uh, drawing platform. Uh, and that was great because it allowed me to uh, you know, develop a lot of details and, and and such. Again, this was even before the internet was really the internet. This is, you're talking about maybe the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I branched over to AutoCAD. Uh, and, I and I went to AutoCAD probably in the late 90s. And I was using AutoCAD up until about 2003 when I had a salesman come into my office who was trying to, because I was using the um, LT version of AutoCAD, and he wanted to sell me the full version of AutoCAD. It was very expensive. And I said to him, well, I, I, I said, I don't think it's quite there yet. I'm very happy with the two-dimensional world. The three-dimensional world's not quite there yet. And he said, well, what would it have to do in order for you to see it as an asset to your practice? And I described that it would have to, uh, it would have to do certain things. There would have to be uh, adjustments to one drawing that would automatically show up in another. And he says to me, he goes, oh, you want Revit? And I said, I want what? You know, I mean, I had heard a, a little bit about Revit, but I hadn't heard much at all. He had a demonstrator on his, on his uh, laptop, and he pulled it up, and I said, that's what I want. So that, at that point, I switched over to Revit, and Revit and Autodesk and um, AutoCAD files could be imported, so I didn't lose anything. There was a very short learning curve changing from AutoCAD to, to Revit. And I've been on Revit since, since mid, since I think July 2003. And um, these, I think the salesman told me I was the first architect in New Jersey to, to buy a license for Revit. I, I can't verify that, but that's what I was told. Um, but again, you know, I see something that works 
and I'm going to implement it. And it's been tremendous as a sole proprietor for to use Revit. It's just a tremendous tool. Wonderful. Well, Bill, you've been an early adopter, and especially with your website, and that's something we're going to touch on next week. Um, but before we finish up today, I just wanted to ask you, what are two or three action steps that you could recommend architects take who are looking to go out on their own but are currently employed by a firm? You should not wait. It doesn't get any easier. Start to implement your plan now. Having said that, you have to have a plan to implement. So sit down and write down a set of short-term and long-term goals and how you're going to get there for each goal and try to start to implement that. And go out in your community, volunteer your time, hand your resume to your local mayor, you know, volunteer to serve on a community board, whether it's zoning board, planning board, health board, or go out and coach kids in softball and baseball. Get out in the community and meet the community and, you know, meet people of surrounding communities. That's how I would begin. That's how you open the door to get people to know you. Because if no one knows you're there and you hang a shingle out, no one's going to see it. Okay, so network, network, network. Yes. And of course, the internet makes that a little bit easier, but it's still about you being physically in a place and helping people directly because that's what they will remember. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Bill, for taking us through the, the journey of your firm up to this date. We really appreciate it. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation guarantee promise agreement affirmation pledge warranty contract bond commitment except to help architects conquer the world bump music credit to Ben Folds 5 do it anyway